Cool. So, hi everybody. Thank you all for coming out today. I hope you're having a good conference so far. Uh, my name is Scott Sanderson. I'm an engineer at a startup in the Boston area called Quantopian. Uh, Quantopian builds tools that let anyone do algorithmic trading in the browser and Python. Um, and so that includes things like uh, IDEs for writing code and hosted at Python notebook environments. And so one of the things that I've spent a fair amount of time doing is building tools and building software systems that are uh, relatively complex, right? The financial domain is sort of full of lots of interesting, quirky unpleasantness. Um, and so trying to find ways of making software systems and the behavior of software systems uh, more intelligible, both to myself as a developer who's working on them, but also to users who are using them. Um, and so, for example, a thing that I worked on for a while is this an API for building sort of computational pipelines over financial data, and one of the things that it can do is spit out graphs like this that show you all the different terms. Um, and so what I want to talk about today is uh, this idea of building self-visualizing systems, or more generally building tools for visualizing the runtime behavior of our programs themselves, uh, and thinking about how can we use the tool set from visualization to actually better understand uh, the tools that we use to visualize things in the first place. Um, so a couple themes that I want to talk about today. Uh, in general, like what, what is it that makes data visualization useful? I think you know, here at Plotly, I don't think I have to be trying to convince people that data visualization is a useful tool, but it's, it's helpful for us to reflect on what it is specifically about visualizing our data that makes it more intelligible to us. Um, then specifically, I'm interested in how can we apply visualization to better understand software systems? And I, I mean that sort of in a very broad sense from you know, single processes to large distributed systems. Um, and in particular, what trade-offs should we be thinking about when we write or when we use tools for visualizing software? And I, I think there's a couple interesting ways that we can think about classifying tools for doing this kind of work and the kinds of trade-offs that they have to make. Um, so this is a quote from William Playfair from the Commercial and Political Atlas, which was published in 1786. Um, and this is the book that's widely credited as being sort of one of the first examples of various kinds of charts, including bar charts and line charts for econometric data. Uh, and Playfair says, information that is imperfectly acquired is, ge is generally as imperfectly retained. And a man who has carefully investigated a printed table finds when done that he has only a faint and very partial idea of what he has read. And right, so what Playfair is saying here is we've got, if we just have some table of numbers and what he has in mind is something like this, so this is a book, or this is a, a page from that book. And Playfair was writing this book that was just about the balance of trade between England and every other country. And literally it's this entire book that's just full of like charts and tables and graphs for disseminating information, which is like kind of a strange thought nowadays to think that someone would publish a whole book just full of like random information about the balance of trade over the last 10 years. But, so Playfair was publishing this book and he had all these tables that looked like this. And this is England's balance of trade with America. So it's all their imports, all their exports. And we can look at this table and we can kind of maybe try to glean some structure here. We might look and notice that something happened around 1776 that kind of changed the, uh, the balance of trade between England and the US. Um, but it's hard just from squinting at this table to get a good sense, right, of the more interesting trends in this data. And so what Playfair did is he took this and he described it as drawing a map of the data, where instead of having latitude and longitude on the X and Y axes, he had time and amounts of money. And so he drew this chart of the balance of imports and exports over time, and now we can see very clearly, right, that you know, for a little while America was you know, importing more and then England was, and then uh, 1776 happens and suddenly England is not importing anything from the US, uh, and then they sort of gradually return to normalcy. Um, and so the, the essential idea here, right, which I think we all can appreciate, is that having a visual representation of data allows us to engage different capacities for thinking about and understanding the data that we're looking at. Right? We can build sort of a geometric intuition about magnitudes by looking at a picture in a way that we can't from just looking at this table of data. Um, another example, because I found a bunch of interesting old charts while I was doing research for this. So this is a uh, chart drawn by Florence Nightingale, a uh, famous uh, sort of founder of the modern nursing profession. Um, this is a chart about the mortality rates in the Crimean War between England and uh, I believe this is on the Russian front. 
and it's showing, it's a polar area chart, and the reason it's laid out polar is that it's two different years, and so it's showing sort of the circularity of the month cycle and showing interesting trends around how different kinds of deaths occurred at different times. Um, and mostly, actually, the point of this chart was to show that all the blue uh, wedges here, which are the vast majority of the area, are deaths from disease, and the little red section here is deaths from actual wounds. Um, and so this was basically the foundation of arguing that the medical care for the, for the English soldiers needed to be dramatically improved because they were losing more, many, many more of their soldiers to inadequate medical care than they were to actual battlefield injuries. Um, and one more interesting old-timey chart. This is a chart of uh, Napoleon's campaign in Russia. Um, and you kind of have to learn to read this one. So the way this chart works is it's showing uh, the tra the, how his troops traversed toward Russia, and he sort of famously like drudged on and on and on into Russia as the winter dragged on and his troops got depleted over time. And so the width of this brown line uh, is how many troops he had over time as he's going further and further toward Moscow. And then the black line, which is getting smaller and smaller, is his troops retreating back out of Moscow. And so this is an interesting chart because it's described, it's, uh, putting a whole bunch of different dimensions simultaneously, on, in, simultaneously in one picture. So it's showing the progression of time, it's showing the geographic pro projections. Um, there's actually a temperature chart down here, so it's showing over the course of that winter retreat how the troops experienced temperature and how that corresponded to their losses. Um, so again, this is you know five, six different axes of data all being presented in a single visualization. Uh, there's not really any way to do this without having without having you know, the, the visual power that we have from something like this. Oops. Um, so summarizing briefly, visualization allows us to compactly summarize the behavior of complex systems. Uh, it allows us to engage our natural capabilities for geometric and spatial reasoning. Um, and it allows us to interact with data sets that are too large to fit in human RAM. Um, so, we just said it, or visualization is this tool that allows us to understand complex systems. Well, software is a complex system, right? We, many of us in this room build software systems and build tools for doing all kinds of things. And those are very, in the same way that, you know, troop movements or diseases or the balance of trade is this complex system that we'd like to be able to understand. Our software is a complex system that we'd like to be able to understand. Um, and so I want to imagine for a moment that we've, we all in this room have been hired to work at Software Engineering Incorporated, and our product manager comes to us and they say, we have all these files full of integers and we don't know what's in any of them. Can you, can you please, data scientists, PlotCon audience, tell us what's in these integers? And so we come up and we look at our file and we say, okay, less uh, input slash not many ints. And you say, okay, you, you don't really have that many integers. I, you know, maybe we could just sort these and look at them and see if we can understand some of the structure. Um, and so, like any normal data scientist would, uh, we're going to pull out our favorite tool for understanding this data, which is ANSI C, uh, and we're going to write a C program, uh, sort.c, that's going to do all the fun things that C programs do, and it's going to check for outputs, and it's going to seg fault, and it's going to corrupt memory, and do all the things that we know and love C programs to do. Uh, and then hopefully if we compile that and we do dot slash insert and put slash uh, not many ints dot text and you know there's a little bit of there's a little bit of a sort of noticeable pause there so it's a really good thing that we wrote this in C because otherwise if we'd written it in some terrible slow language like Python or R there's no way we would have gotten through this right we could never have possibly looked at all of this data in that amount of time. Um, so we come back to our product manager, we've, you know, we've, we've solved this problem, we've written this program to sort your integers, you can look at the min value, you can look at the max value, you can look at the values in the middle, we're done. Um, and so that's you know, all well and good. Uh, and then the product manager comes back and says, well that was just the sample data and we actually have too many ants. And if we try to insert too many ants, then we're gonna hang out for a while. And so A, this is taking far too long, and B, we have no longer any useful information about this data set anymore, right? We just printed a giant table of integers and we're back to kind of square one because we didn't actually visualize the data, right? We just sorted it and displayed it in a different format. Maybe, maybe in a certain sense, organizing textual data is a form of visualization, but it's a pretty, pretty simple form of visualization. Um, and so leaving aside the actual problem at hand, 
Uh, we're going to go down the rabbit hole and try to understand, well, why is this program so slow? Right? We wrote it in C. We should be able to handle you know, a one megabyte file of, of integers. Um, and so what tools do we have in our, in our disposal for understanding the behavior of this complex software system we've written? Right? And we could try to inspect the code. Uh, source slash input insort.c. Um, but there's, you know, there's almost 100 lines here. There's no way anyone could possibly understand all this code. Um, and so we can move to some more automated tooling. Um, so one thing, if you're on a Linux system, you can use to understand a program like this is a tool called Perf. Um, and so Perf can do a whole bunch of things, but among the things that it can do is uh, do what's called stack sampling of a running program. And so what we're going to do is say Perf... Uh, I'm suddenly blanking on the command. Uh, perf record, there we go. Perf record dash f, so 75. So this says every 75 milliseconds, and we're going to say dash g, which of course everyone knows means keep track of the call stack. Um, dash dash, which says now here's the actual program that I want you to run. And then I'm going to say dot slash insert input slash too many ints dot text. And so what this says, I want perf to run the program to the right of the double dash, and every 75 seconds I want you to sample the C call stack and record it somewhere. And we'll let that go for a second. Um, doo -doo -doo. There we go. And at the end of that, perf says, all right, we captured and wrote uh, about a tenth of a megabyte of data. We've got 732 samples, and we wrote it to perf.data. Um, and so we might think that we could just look at that, but unfortunately, it spits it out in a binary format, so we have to do perf script. And then it shows us this kind of incomprehensible thing. So this is uh, a whole bunch of the stacks that it sampled from that running program. And so that first stack is caught somewhere in like the deep guts of how a C program starts up, but the next one looks a little more reasonable. So we're in libc start main, then we're in main, then we're in print sorted line, parse int line, and then we're in a function called busy wait, which looks awful suspicious. Um, but okay, so now we have this table of data. We kind of have, maybe we could look at this, but again, we still don't really have any intuition for how to understand this data. Um, and what we'd like is some way of understanding the structure of those call stacks. Um, fortunately for us, uh, we're not the only people who've had this problem. So Brendan Gregg, who is now, who worked at Sun Microsystems and is now a performance engineer at Netflix and writes a lot about uh, systems performance, has written this suite of tools for generating a visualization called flame graphs. And the way that a flame graph works is that it shows you how much work has been done at every layer of a call stack of a running program. Uh, and so in order to generate a flame graph, the first thing we have to do is take these stack samples and collapse them so that we have a count of how many times we saw each, you know, unique stack here, right? So we've got a whole bunch of duplicates. Oops. We've got a whole bunch of duplicates here, and we want to collapse them down so we can have a sense of how to actually look at the data here. And there are, the flame graph tool set can actually understand a whole bunch of different programs, but it comes with a, pro a program called stack collapse perf. So we can take perf script, pipe it to stack collapse perf, and it's .pl because it's a Perl script. So I'm not going to show you the source because it's a Perl script. Perf.pl. It's actually quite nice readable Perl in, insofar as that's a thing that's possible. Um, and so now, you know, this is a little bit tricky to read, but what this is is semicolon delimited uh, lists of the functions that are in those call stacks, and then at the end there's a count of how many times that appeared. So there's a whole bunch of ones here, but then we can say, for example, that we saw libc start main, main, print sorted, bubble sort, uh, 220 times here. And so, okay, so this is great, right? This is closer to something that we could imagine visualizing. We could maybe imagine writing a tool to take this and generate maybe a histogram of something like this. Um, but that would actually lose some information, right? So these aren't just random, unique things that we've sampled. There's a tree structure to these. So for some of these, right, all of these, you know, ones that we actually have a fair amount of samples for, you know, they start with main and then print sorted line and then bubble sort. And then sometimes we got a sample that was just in bubble sort. Sometimes we got a sample that was in swap inside of bubble sort. Sometimes we were in busy wait. So it would be nice if we had some visualization that could actually respect and show us that tree structure. 
Uh, and so we can do that, and in fact, there's another tool called uh, flamegraph.pl, and this spits out an SVG, so we'll pipe that to int sort SVG, and then we will open that in Chrome. And this is what we get. So you can see that at the bottom here, so the way to read this is that width tells us how long uh, or how much time we spent in a particular function, and then the height tells us the call stack there. So we can say that we spent all of our time underneath all, which makes sense, and all of our time underneath insort, and all of our time underneath unknown, and then where you would think your program starts is main, right? But there's actually a little bit of stuff over before you get into main. So it looks like we got context switched out on a thread here. But the part that we're really interested in is the stuff that's above main. And then we can say that we basically spent all of our time in main and print sorted line. And then up on print sorted line is where we start to get some interesting information, right? So we say that we spent about a little less than half the time in bubble sort, of which we spent about you know, another quarter of that in swap. We spent 26% of our time busy waiting, which maybe wasn't the best algorithmic design. Um, and then we spent another 26% or 30% of our time busy waiting in parse int line. And then we've got a little call stack over here, which might have been catching a printf. Uh, I have no idea what that was. Oh, that's a task switch, so we got context switched out again. Um, so one of the things to notice about this, right, is it's statistical sampling. So we, we're not guaranteed to capture all the behavior of our program, right? We, we printed a bunch of times in that program. Nothing in this visualization told us that we printed. So we might have to run our program for a long time or run it on a big set of data or run it with more fine-grained sampling in, sort of, in order to reliably uh, capture all of the behavior of our program. Um, but the downside is there's basically no overhead, or the upside is there's basically no overhead to this, and we can run it on literally any program you want, right? Any program on your system, you could run perf on like this, and it would give you interesting information. Um, so that's perf, perf's cool tool, uh, and the flame graph tools are, are really interesting. Um, so back to our original problem at hand, right? We had all these integers, and we wanted to understand them. Um, and so we've decided, all right, maybe, maybe writing our visualization tool set in C isn't such a great idea, so maybe a better thing to do would be to use, say, Python, and maybe we should just generate like a histogram of those integers. Um, so instead of writing 100 lines of C, we can write like five lines of Python, less source histogram.py, so we can say, with open my file, read all the ints, seaborn.displot, save the file. Whole bunch easier, so I can do Python, Source histogram inputs. We'll even bump it up to way too many ints here. And we'll let that go, and I need to tell it where to go. Uh, histogram.png. There we go. And we'll do, I actually don't think Chrome knows how to open that, so go to histogram.png, and you can see we, we have this nice sort of centered distribution, and if we did some further statistical testing on this, we'd know that this was a, a logistic distribution. Um, so that's interesting, but even that program took a fair amount of time, right, and it would be interesting if we could learn some more information about what that program was doing. Um, and so we already learned how to use perf, so we could use perf to understand our Python program. Uh, and in the interest of saving time, I'm gonna do run Profile histogram. So this is just bash function. I'm just, oop, that's not what I wanted. I want make histogram flame graph. Uh, so this is just doing the same thing as before, except it's switching in different uh, a different program. So we're going to run make histogram frame, flame graph, and we'll let that go for a second. And then we can open up histogram flame graph.svg. And we got a way more interesting histogram this time, right? Our C Python is a much more complex program than just our insorting program. Um, but one of the things that we'll actually notice here, right, is that there's not, not, not much of what's in this flame graph actually corresponds to how we would sort of semantically think about our program, right? Our program was about five lines of nice Python. 
And if we poke around in this, what we're going to see is that all of these things are sort of operating at the semantic information level of our C program and at the level really of what the kernel understands because perf is ultimately a kernel tracing tool, um, which is both good and bad. So right, one of the things we might notice here is that we're spending an enormous amount of time in uh, sysced yield, which is telling us that we're probably thrashing running too many parallel processes. Um, but on the flip side, we have no idea like what part of our Python program was actually slow. And so what we really need is some tool that can give us information at the semantic level of Python. Um, and so CPython actually comes with a tool built in for doing this. It's called CProfile. And so if I do type run profile histogram, then I can do python mc profile, spit out a stats file, and so in our first example, we were doing uh, what's called statistical sampling, right, where we were saying, every so often, I'm just gonna look at this program and see what its state is, and I'm gonna record that information and go somewhere else. Um, in C profile, instead of doing that, what we're gonna do is run in a mode where we're tracing, right? So instead of periodically waking up and seeing what the program's doing, we're actually going to sort of run the program in a harness where every time the program tries to do something, we're gonna intercept that and record it before we continue going. And so if I do profile histogram, then again, we're gonna run our histogram function, which takes a couple seconds, because otherwise why would we be profiling it? And then in order to look at this, we again need another tool, which is uh, pstats. So we're gonna do python dash m pstats, and we spat this out to stats dot dat, stats dot dat, and this drops us in this interactive terminal interface. And I can do things like sort by total time, and do stats 10, say. Uh, and I can sort by this and look at, a, at this in a bunch of other ways. Um, and so this is useful in some ways, right? It's interactive, so I can explore this. If I, don't, if I didn't know what I wanted ahead of time, this is nice because I can actually go drill into it and try to understand the structure of my data more deeply. But again, we're back out to the, the Playfair table, right? Where we're looking at this and we're trying to sort of build some intuition for the structure of this data. And it would be nice if we had a tool that could actually give us you know, the ability to bring our geometric intuitions to bear on this a little more powerfully. Um, and so I wrote a tool for doing that. Um, and so it's called pstats viewer. And we're just gonna point it at that same stats file and this is a relatively well documented format. And this is gonna internally read it into a pandas data frame and then use some of the fancy Python uh, visual, or IPython visualization machinery to give us a more dynamic view of this. So we can render this as a dynamic table and I can sort this and filter it and do some other nice things with it. Um, and I can look at and see, okay, I'm spending most of my time in, if I can click on this here. Spending most of our time in, I think, numpy.reduceat. Um, so this is nice, we've, we've got a little bit more interactivity here, but then I think the real power here is that I can generate charts from this as well, and I can use the IPython widgets to generate uh, charts by cumulative time or by total time, and I can scale up or scale down the number of things that I wanna see, and I can zoom in and I can do some other fancy things. Um, and so again, this is, the, the thing that I sort of am interested in here is that we've had to make a trade-off here, right, between the, the specificity of the tool and the information that can tell us about our program and the sort of usefulness of, of that information at the semantic level that our program operates. So perf is a tool that we can run on essentially any program that we can run on our computer, but the downside is it has to operate at the sort of semantic level of understanding of my, my operating system kernel. Um, pstats and this pstats viewer tool, by contrast, uh, only works with Python, right? This is a Python specific tool. It only understands how Python works. But as a trade-off for that, it actually understands how Python works. And it can tell me information like I spent a lot of time in matplot really writing PNGs instead of telling me that I spent time in like some syscall writing somewhere. Um, and so one thing that I was sort of thinking about while I was working on this talk is, is this an inherent trade-off, right? Is there, is there sort of necessarily this spectrum between generality of a tool and the sort of level of abstraction at which the tool operates. And I think in some ways that's the answer to that is true. And then the natural follow up to that is, well, what are the extremes of that spectrum? And I think perf is pretty close to the, to one extreme of that spectrum where that basically can understand any tool that I can run on my laptop. 
And so what's the other end of that spectrum? So we've looked at a tool here that understands the behavior of a specific running program, or sorry, of, of any Python program, but it doesn't know anything about the particular program that I ran. So what would it look like to create tools that, can, that are specialized for particular programs? Or what kinds of advantages could we get from building tools that are designed to visualize particular programs? Um, and so I thought about that and thought about interesting tools and what, you know, what an interesting demo for that might be. And then I couldn't think of anything that's better than the demo that I've seen Matt Rockland give a whole bunch of times for Dask. Uh, so Dask is a tool for doing distributed computation or for parallel computation. And it works by building up task graphs and then executing them in interesting ways in parallel. So it can run in threads, it can run in processes, um, and it can run on remote clusters. And so the way this works is we're gonna build up a little execution graph of stuff that we'd like to run in parallel. And then we're gonna execute that with a client. So here I'm just building up a task graph. And Dask represents all of its task graphs as dictionaries. So it kind of looks something like this. But probably a better way to look at that is using, so this is already one interesting new way to visualize a program, right? Where Dask has built-in capabilities for visualizing its task graph representation as an actual visual graph. And we can look at this and we can get some pretty interesting insights out of this, right? We can say that, well, there's probably some opportunities for parallelism because there's lots of little parallel branches happening here. But there's also some places where we can't be parallel, right? This reduction operation at the end, for example, we can't really parallelize because it depends on everything that came before it. Um, and we can run this. And in a second, it'll tell us that I believe the output of that's just going to be none. Um, so that's cool. So we can, we can look at the static structure of this program. And this program under, knows how to give us information about what it's going to do. Um, but particularly for a parallel tool, it would be nice if we could have some visual intuition for how the program's actually behaving. And this is a place where, you know, traditionally we might, you know, log from our program, or we might collect metrics from our program, or, you know, we might try to profile it, but profiling starts to get hard once we have multiple threads or multiple processes. Um, and so Dask actually ships with this really nifty tool for visualizing the task stream that we're sending to the cluster. And so if I run this again, it has it cached, so it may not actually show that there. But if I run a big task graph, then what is going to show up in the bottom here is uh, every colored bar here corresponds to a single task. And so this was from that previous run I did. So I've got a whole bunch of these little short loads, which are all these, this first line. And then I've got this long yellow load from SQL, which is this big circle. And then I sort of could resume parallelism once I, once I had finished that piece. Um, and then you'll notice at the very end here, we couldn't do anything in parallel. So, sorry, I should have explained the horizontal bars here correspond to a single worker and the individual blocks correspond to tasks and the duration of a task that's been assigned to that worker. Um, and so now if I run, we ran a relatively small graph down here, which was doing about 10 uh, big columns. So this is one that's doing about 100 of those. And if we execute that, we should see this tool kind of, maybe. There we go, okay. Just needed to refresh. So this is what it actually looks like when it's running, right? And it's showing me all of the different tasks that are being dynamically sent to the cluster and all of the places where it's going. And then we can see, for example, at the end, we can confirm that intuition we had that there's no real opportunities for parallelism at the end of this task because all of our tools suddenly had to merge into one computation. And that's manifested at the end here by just having one worker doing work. Um, so wrapping up very briefly, uh, there's sort of this inherent trade-off inherent trade between generality and level of abstraction. There's also, I think, kind of an inherent trade-off between compositionality, right, the ability to pipe a program to another program, and simplicity of use for a human being. Um, and interactivity, in particular, is really helpful for these cases where we don't yet know what we're looking for when we're running a tool. Uh, I already did the demo. Some references. I'll post these slides afterwards. Uh, I think I'm out of time for questions, but if people are interested, feel free to come up, and I'm happy to talk to you for as much time as you want. Thank you.